the Count of Monte Cristo, Chapter 3, The Count of Monte about a hundred paces from the spot where the two friends were sitting, sipping their wine, the village of the Catalans rose behind a bare hill, exposed to the fierce sun and swept by the biting northwest wind. One day, a mysterious colony set out from Spain and landed on the narrow strip of land which they inhabit to this very day. No one knew whence they came or what tongue they spoke. One of their chiefs, who could speak a little provincial, solicited from the commune of Marseille the barren, barren promontory on which they, like the sailors of ancient times, had run their boats ashore. Their request was granted, and three months later, around the twelve or fifteen boats which had brought these Bohemians from the sea, there arose a little village. This is the same village that we see today, constructed in an odd and picturesque fashion, half Moorish and half Spanish, inhabited by the descendants of these people and speaking the language of their fathers. For three or four centuries, they remained faithful to the little promontory on which they had settled like a flight of seabirds. They did not mix with the inhabitants of Marseille, but intermarried amongst their own folk and preserved the customs and costumes of their original country just as they preserved its language. We would ask our readers to follow us along the way only street of this little hamlet and enter with us one of its tiny houses. A young and beautiful girl, with hair as black as jet and eyes of the velvety softness of the gazelle, was standing, leaning against the wall. Three steps away, a young man of about twenty years of age was sitting, tilting his chair and leaning his elbow on an old, worm-eaten piece of furniture. He was looking at the girl with an air which betrayed both vexation and uneasiness. His eyes questioned her, but the girl's firm and steady gaze checked him. Mercedes, said the young man. Easter is nearly round again, and it is just the right time for a wedding. Give me an answer, do. I have answered you a hundred times, Fernand. I really think you must be your own enemy that you should ask me again. I have never encouraged you in your hopes, Fernand. You cannot reproach me with one coquettish look. I have always said to you, I am fond of you as a brother, but never, never ask anything more of me. My heart belongs to another. Haven't I always told you that, Fernand? Yes, I know, Mercedes. I know that you have always been cruelly frank with me. Fernand, Mercedes answered, shaking her head. A woman becomes a bad housekeeper and cannot even be sure of remaining a good wife when she loves another than her husband. Be satisfied with my friendship, for I repeat it once more. This is all I can promise you. Fernand rose from his seat, walked round the room, and returned to Mercedes, standing before her with scowling brows. Tell me once more, Mercedes. Is this your final answer? I love Edmond Dantes, the girl answered coldly, and none other shall be my husband. You will always love him as long as I live. Fernand bowed his head in defeat, having a sigh resembling a heaving a sigh resembling a groan, and then suddenly raising his head, hissed between his clenched teeth. But if he is dead, if he is dead, I too shall die. But if he forgets you. Mercedes, cried a gladsome voice outside the door. Mercedes! Ah, oh, the girl exclaimed, blushing with joy and love. You see, he has not forgotten me since here he is. And she ran toward the door, which opened, calling, Here, Edmond, here I am. Fernand, pale and trembling, recoiled like a wayfarer at the sight of a snake, and finding a chair, sat down on it. Edmond and Mercedes fell into each other's arms. The fierce Marseille sun which penetrated the room through the open door covered them with a flood of light. At first they saw nothing around them. Their intense happiness isolated them from the rest of the world. Suddenly, Edmond became aware of the gloomy countenance of Fernand peering out of the shadows, pale and menacing, and instinctively the young man put a hand to the knife at his belt. I beg your pardon, said Dantes. I did not perceive that there were three of us here. Then turning to Mercedes, he asked, Who is this gentleman? He will be your best friend, Dantes, for he is my friend. He is my cousin, Fernand, the man whom, after you, I love best in the world. Don't you recognize him? <laughs> so it is, Edmond said, and still keeping Mercedes' hand clasped in his, he held the other one out in all friendliness to the Catala. Instead, however, responding to the show of cordiality, Fernand remained mute and motionless as a statue. Edmond cast an inquiring glance at the agitated and trembling Mercedes, and then at Fernand, who stood there gloomily and forbidding. This glance told him all, and his brow became suffused with anger. You did not hasten thus to your, to your sight to find an enemy here, Mercedes. An enemy, Mercedes cried with an angry look at her cousin. An enemy in my house, did you say, Edmond? 
You have no enemy here. For now, my brother is not your enemy. He will grasp your hand in token of devoted friendship. So saying, Mercedes fixed the young Catalan with an imperious look, and as though mesmerized, he slowly approached Edmond and held out his hand. Like a powerless, though furious wave, his hatred had broken against the ascendancy which this girl exercised over him. But no sooner had he touched onto his hand than he felt he had done all that was within his power. He turned tail and fled out of the house. Oh, he cried, run out, running along like one demented and tearing his hair. How can I get rid of this fellow? Poor, wretched fool that I am. Hey, Fanon, where are you running to? A voice called out. The young man suddenly stopped, turned around, and perceived Cateros seated at a table in an arbor of a tavern with Don Blanc. Why don't you join us? said Cateros. You are in such a hurry that you cannot wait to press the time of day with your friends, especially when those friends have a good bottle, have a full bottle before them, Don Blanc added. Fernand looked at the two men as though dazed and answered not a word. Then he wiped away the perspiration that was coursing down his face and slowly entered the arbor. The cool shade of the place seemed to restore him to calmness and brought a feeling of relief to his exhausted body. He uttered a groan that was almost a sob and let his head fall onto his arms across the table. Shall I tell you what you look like, Fernand? said Cateros, opening the conversation with that frank brutality which the lower classes show when their curiosity gets the upper hand of them. You look like a rejected lover, and he accompanied this little jest with a coarse laugh. What are you saying, said Dunbar? A man of his good looks is never unlucky in love. You've made a bad shot this time, Cateros. Not at all. Just listen to his sighs. Come, Fernand, rise your head and give us an answer. It is not polite to give no reply when friends inquire about your health. I am quite well, said Fernand, without raising his head. As you see, Don Blas, Cateros said, winking at his friend, this is how the land lies. Fernand, whom you see here and who is one of the bravest and best of the Catalans, to say nothing of being one of the best fishermen in Marseille, is in love with a pretty girl called Mercedes. Unfortunately, however, this fair damsel appears to be in love with the mate of the Ferriol, and as the Ferriol put him to port today, well, you understand. No, I don't understand. Poor Fernand has given away his queen day, that's all. And what about it, said Fernand, raising his head and looking at Cateros as if he would vent his anger on him. Mercedes is tied to no man, and she is free to love anyone she likes, isn't she? Of course. If you take it like that, it is quite a different matter, but I thought you were a Catalan, and I have always been told that a Catalan is not a man to be supplanted by a rival. It has even been said that Fernand is terrible in his vengeance. Poor fellow, Don Blanc exclaimed, pretending to feel a great pity for the young man. You see, he did not expect Dantes to return in this way without giving any warning. Perhaps he thought him dead, or even faithless. When is the wedding to take place? asked Hadros, on whom the fumes of the wine were beginning to take effect. The date is not yet fixed, Fernand mumbled. No, but it will be, as surely as Dantes will be captain of the Therion. Eh, Dangla? Dangla started this unexpected attack, and turning toward Cateros, scrutinized his face to try to detect whether this blow had been premeditated. He could read nothing, however, but envy on that drink besotted face. Ah, well, said he, filling the glass, let us drink to Captain Edmond Dantes, husband of the beautiful Catalan. Cateros raised his glass to his mouth with a trembling hand and emptied it at one gulp. Fernand took his glass and dashed it to the ground. Look here, hiccuped Cateros. What do I see on the top of the hill yonder near the Catalans? You have better sight than I, Fernand. Come and look. I believe my sight is beginning to fail me, and you know wine is treacherous. I seem to see two lovers walking side by side and clasping hands. Heaven forgive us. They have no idea we can see them, for they are actually kissing. Dunblad did not lose one second expression. Did not lose one agonized expression on Fernand's face. Do you know them, Monsieur Fernand? He asked. Yes, the latter answered in a husky voice. It is Monsieur Edmond and Mademoiselle Mercedes. You don't mean to say so, said Catherine. Fancy might not recognize them. Hello, Dantes. Hello, fair damsel. Come here and tell us when the wedding is to be, for Monsieur Fernand is so obstinate that he won't say a word. Be quiet, said Dunblau, pretending to restrain Cateros, who, with the tenacity of a drunkard, was leaning out of the arbor. Try to stand up straight and leave the lovers to their lovemaking. Now look at Fernand. He, at any rate, has got some sense. Dunblau first looked at one and at the other of the two men. 
the one intoxicated with drink, the other mad with love. I shall not get any further with these two fools, he muttered. Dantes will certainly carry the day. He will marry that fair damsel, become a captain, and have the laugh over us unless a livid smile will seem to pass over his lips. Lips, unless I sit to work. Hello, Cateros continued to call out, half out of his seat and banging on the table. Hi there! Edmond, don't you recognize your friends or are you too proud to speak to them? No, my dear fellow, I am not proud, but I am in love, and I believe that love is more apt to make one blind than pride is. Bravo, a good excuse, Cadros said. Good day, Madame Dantes. Mercedes curtsied gravely and said, That is not yet my name, and in my country it is looked upon as bringing bad luck when a girl has given her sweetheart's name before he has become her husband. Call me Mercedes, if you please. I suppose your wedding will take place once, Monsieur Dantes, said Danglars, bowing to the young couple. As soon as possible, Monsieur Dangla. All the preliminaries will be arranged with my father today, and tomorrow, the day after, at the latest, we shall give the betrothal feast at La Roselle here, at which we hope to see all our friends. You are invited, Monsieur Dangla, as also you, Caros, and you, of course, Fernand. Fernand opened his mouth to in answer, but his voice died in his throat, and he could not say a single word. The preliminaries today? Tomorrow, the betrothal feast? To be sure, you are in a great hurry, Captain. Dangla. Edmond said, smiling, I repeat what Mercedes said to Cateros just now. Do not give me the title that does not yet belong to me. It brings bad luck. I beg your pardon. I simply said that you seem to be in a great hurry. Why, there's plenty of time. The fairy one won't put to sea for another three months. One is always in a hurry to be happy, Monsieur Dangla. For when one has been suffering for a long time, it is difficult to believe in one's good fortune. But it is not self-illness alone that <clears throat> but it is not selfishness alone that prompts me to press this matter. I have to go to Paris. You are going on business? No, not on my account. I have a last commission of Captain Leclerc's to execute. You understand, Douglas, it is sacred. But you can put your mind at rest. I shall go straight there and back again. Yes, yes, said Douglas aloud. Then to himself he said, to Paris. No doubt to deliver the letter Marshal gave him. Better and better. This letter has given me an excellent... Dear, ah, oh, Dantas, my friend, you are not yet entered into the Baryon's log book as number one. Then turning to Edmond, who was moving away, he called out, Bon voyage! Thank you, Edmond replied, turning round and giving him a friendly nod. Then the two lovers went their way, peaceful and happy, like two of the elect on their way to heaven, while the three men continued their interesting conversation.